Well, good morning. Welcome to Oak Ridge Community Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Why don't you guys stand up and say hello to somebody around you, and we're going to go to worship. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Awesome. That was one of the songs we, we sang at our VBS this year, but then we went down to Big Stuff Camp, and that was one of the big ones down yeah. there as well. And you, you, you were a leader down at Big Stuff, right? Yes, I was. So, so t- how, was, how was your camp? Amazing. Um, honestly, the best week of the entire year. It was so hard to say goodbye this year, but as I was leaving, do you know what the ocean said to me? It didn't say anything. It just waved. Were, were these your girls? Nice you got a, girls. They're, they're, that's your fan club, so they encourage you. You got some plants on the front row. I like that. That's that's really good. So are you tired? You worn out? You have a good week? I'm exhausted, and my voice is still a little shaky, so if I crack, I'm sorry. Yeah, so it, it was a great week, and I went down there, and I had the perfect setup. So I, I had a room on the first floor, and it just happened to where I don't even know how. The, the two rooms next to me were totally empty. So I was able to go to sleep once curfew was over and kind of was able to get my seven hours of sleep until the last night. 
And then uh, the last night in one of the rooms, they had a pipe issue. So they had to move them from that room to the room next to me. And it happened to be 10th grade girls. And um, I'm still recovering because I just heard screaming and yelling and doors open and slamming and laughter until 3 in the morning that last night. And so I'm so sorry your one night was rough. Yeah, it was rough. So. <laughs> And, and then I had to sleep on the airplane coming back while you guys were on the 18-hour bus ride. So my neck's a little bad and stuff. So, yeah. But seriously, it was one of the best weeks of the year. It was the best week of the year. There's Absolutely. no doubt. And we've got a little video just showing you guys a little bit what went on. are an original, not because you were first, but because God first loved you and he has been proving it to you since the beginning of the world. He designed you to know him. Living original, is challenging but alone it is impossible originals need a crew so my hope for you is that you would find those people and together we become the originals that god intended us to be says, I didn't come to make bad people good. I came to make dead people come back to life. That's what makes Jesus original. That's what makes him different. It's this word right here. It's called grace. lives enriched by our mediocrity we've been created for greatness for greatness we've been called to excellence we, we are, are the healer sent, sent to mend a broken world. world we are the thinkers crafting solutions to the problems that plague us we are the visionaries set to lead when surrounded by darkness we're the unique leaders poised to take this week and turn it into a lifetime a lifetime we are the hope we are the dream we, we are, are the, the originals, originals. yeah that was the theme of the camp was originals. And, and, you know, I do want to say we're not a real competitive church or anything, but we did win both the volleyball and the basketball <laughs> tournaments down at camp. So, yeah. So, um, but much more importantly, we, we baptized 41 students down in the ocean. So it was a, yeah. I've got goosebumps right now. You can testify to that. I had goosebumps during that thing. I wish I could transport you all down there and experience uh, what big stuff is all about and the investment that you guys make in our next generation. And let me tell you, it's in good hands. We have an amazing group of students that are on fire from Christ. And sure, they're normal teenagers and they're going to make mistakes, but they get this Jesus thing. And so you guys should be really proud. They can uh, kind of experience a little bit of big stuff, though, when? Absolutely. Um, next Sunday, The Edge is back. <laughs> Yeah, we are so excited. It's been a great summer, but it's been a long summer without The Edge, so we are so excited to get going again. If you don't know what The Edge is, it's just our student service. It's up here on Sunday nights. If you're going into 7th grade through 12th grade, um, it's designed for you, but really we say everybody is welcome. If you've never experienced it, regardless of age, we'd love to see you there. Um, we worship a little. We hear a talk, usually from Josh, and then we break off into small groups. So um, we have some really big things planned for this next week. We're so excited, and we would love to see all of you there. Yeah, 
I, I, I go to every edge service all year long, but I would tell you guys, put it on your calendar next Sunday night. Come to church in the morning, but then come to church back up here again Sunday night at 6 o'clock. If you're a parent, for sure come, and, and you'll catch a little vision and glimpse of what's going to go on all year long. But even if you're not a parent, even if you don't have a student or a grandchild, I'm telling you, come up here, and, and you will be encouraged. You will be enthused about what is going on, and you will see kind of just... Uh, what we experienced down there, and, and you won't regret it. So mark it down. Come next Sunday evening. Let's pack this place out, and, and it's just an, an awesome time. Um, I know Katie also wanted you to talk a little bit about on down a little bit, the younger students. Right? Yes, so August 6th, we're having a kindergarten night. Um, so you, if you have a child who's in kindergarten, we're going to have all the kids come up here, just take a bus ride, go get some ice cream, just have a fun hangout night. But we do need you to RSVP to that so we can um, plan accordingly. There's a number in your bulletin to RSVP to, as well as some additional details regarding um, times and locations. And then also, the kids' ministry is actually in need of some volunteers right now. If that's something um, that you might be interested in or would like some more information on, there's also a number in your bulletin for you to text to get more information. Yeah, and it's amazing how, you know, our ministries just feed on each other. Our, our youth ministry, you know, high schoolers, middle schoolers, have gotten much better as Detour and our student ministries have gotten better. So it plays on it. And so whatever level you serve in, and just understand you're making a huge difference in the kingdom of what's going forward. Hey, the backpack attack out there. I was told today that, that, um, that we we're up to like 500 backpacks given out. So um, still do that. Bring those in. I think they ran out. You guys have taken more. I think they ran out of the, like, the forms telling you what to get. So if you get them now, just bring general things. But those are going to go to some people in our congregation that need help with that area. They're going to go to foster families, and then they're going to go, and we're going to make an impact on local school districts. So keep bringing them, and, and we, want, we want the word of God, you know, the kingdom message to get out, and that's one of the ways that we can do it. Um, coming up, we're, we're starting to get into our fall things on, October, on August the 12th. You're going to hear testimonies if you come up to the baptism service that day from many of those students that, that were baptized down in the ocean, but you also have a chance if you haven't taken that step um, in baptisms, if you believe in Jesus Christ and have not gone public with your faith uh, through the waters of baptism, we encourage you to sign up. Tom's going to talk more about that in his message, so I'll leave that go. Coming up on, I know it's a little advanced notice, but on September the 14th, as we're moving into the fall season, we have Married Life Live. And we're doing, uh, it's, it's, yeah, no, we get all the applause for the youth things, but the Married Life Live, not, not one thing. So um, we're doing something we've never done before. We're actually bringing in a guest speaker. He's a pastor and a comedian that specializes in marriage. So it is going to sell out. The cost is going to be a little bit more. It's going to be 40 bucks. Tickets are going to go on sale next week. But do not, th don't waste this opportunity. This is a time to ask neighbors, a time to, to invite um, co-workers and things, fill up, you know, take a table for yourself. You won't regret it. You're going to have a night of laughter and a night of learning about marriage and, and enhancing that and, and all the things that go along with that. And then uh, Tom wanted me to mention the Oak Bridge City update. All the asbestos has been removed. No problems, no surprises. So that's huge. They've demolished the place. Walls have been, have been taken down, and now they're starting to build it back up. So everything seems to be on schedule for a fall opening, and, and we're good to go. You got anything else? Um, just a few more announcements for our first-time guests. Um, we just first off want to say welcome. We're so glad you're here. We have new guest brochures that are available at our information center, so go ahead and grab one of these after service. Um, tells you a little bit about our church, but also gives you two free coupons, one for a free drink and the second for a free T-shirt from our bookstore. And then also you'll notice we don't take an offering in service. Um, if you're a guest, we ask that you not give and let this service be our gift to you. Um, but if you call Oak Ridge your home, there's joy boxes throughout the campus, and there's also giving online. And then lastly, there's no communion in service, but there's a room right behind me called the Reflection Room where there is communion available. Great. I'm going to say a prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you so much um, that we get to be a part of your kingdom that we get, to, we get to live in it, that we get to experience it, but that also, Father, we get to influence other people and invite them into it with the amazing message uh, of, of you and your son, Jesus, who, who loves us so much that you sacrificed uh, on a cross his life. And, and Father, that, that he died but didn't stay there, that he conquered sin and death and, and the grave by rising again three days later. We celebrate that this morning. We are here because of that reason. And, and Father, just thank you that, that you're a good God who loves us so much. Help us for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes to focus on praise and worship, telling you how great you are, how amazing you are, with thankfulness in our hearts. In the mighty name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and sing.
stories of a Savior Holding this with human hands Treasure for the trader No tears to do I've seen The image of the Father Until heaven came to live with me Who rescued like no other And you are
You know, I take a seat. You know, I've said it before, but I, I know that I'm really worshiping when at some point during the songs, I, I'm convicted of sin. I mean, I understand my need for a Savior and for a God, and, and I realize how often I fall short. But it's not this guilt-ridden conviction. It's a, it's a, it's a conviction that it, it ends in thanksgiving and praise to our amazing God because I'm reminded in the songs that we sing of his amazing love and his amazing attributes and his greatness and glory. So I think that sets us up after worship for prayer where we can go to God remembering who he is, what he's done for us, and the fact that he's a loving father who, who gives us answers and listens when we speak to him. So why don't you take some time before Tom comes up and starts us off in this new series this week, take some time to, to bring your request to God. Understand that he listens and that he cares. Let's go to God. Father in heaven, your name is, is hallowed. It is to be revered. It is like no other. Help us to not take this privilege, this, this, this opportunity lightly, that we get to come into the presence of the holy, one true God, the God who spoke in the universe, leaped into existence. Father, we thank you um, and praise you for your majesty and glory, but Father, also for the fact that you are a loving Father that you just heard every single request that went up to you and that you care about every one of them. Father, I know that just this morning I've already had three or four people come up to me with, with relationship problems, with, with health issues, with tragedies that have struck. And Father, they don't know where to turn other than to you. 
And we know that that's the exact right place to go. So, Father, I pray that, that we are comforted in our time of need and in our grief. And that, that Father, we ask you to, to calm the storm. We ask you to take away uh, some of these issues, to heal physical problems. We ask you to heal relationships. But we also know that, that sometimes the answer is later or no. And, 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 Father, we ask you then to calm us in the midst of those storms. So, so God, we just, just give you praise and honor this morning. Um, knowing that you are our Savior, that you are our rescuer, and help us to grow in faith, uh, to trust you more. Even during life's tough and difficult seasons, Father, um, help us to have the peace that you offer. Help us to have attentive ears and hearts as we are convicted by this message that Tom brings. Help these words to come from you and lead us to change so that we can know you more and so that we can impact the people around us more for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a little video you can watch. Good morning. Do a little bit better than that. Good morning. Good morning. This is part one. My name is Tom Noble. If you're a guest, by the way, I'm one of the pastors here. But we're at part one of a series called Some Assembly Required. And um, before I, you'll get what we're talking about in a second. But I just want to give you a couple updates, a couple things I've observed here recently. You know, my son, uh, Matt, and my daughter-in-law, Ann, they moved down to Atlanta. And he's a youth pastor down there, a college pastor. And they're going to adopt they are ready to adopt. They've got a room already, so they've paid for the adoption process, and they're just waiting to get a newborn baby. And I think that's very, very cool. And uh, <laughs> but then uh, one of our families here just got back from China, and they went back there and they adopted their their second child from China. And I think that's that's so cool. They go all the that way, spend all that money. Then I know a lot of you here at, at Oak Bridge are, are fostering or considering fostering. We had a kind of a big push towards that in the fall, and there are quite a few families that signed up for that. And I think that's, that is amazing as well. And this past week, I was at this camp called Big Stuff Camp, which is a week-long camp in, in Panama City Beach, Florida, with 1,500 other uh, middle school and high school stu students, primarily high school. But while we were down there, there was a lady that is just one of my heroes at church, and she's a mom of a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and she went down... Uh, to camp so she could shepherd her girls. We work with small groups here so she could stay with her group of girls down there. And I thought that's all incredible to leave her family and to leave her kids to go down and watch kids. And here's the reason that all those things are done. Here's the reason that Matt and Ann are adopting a kid. Here's the reason uh, they brought back another baby from China. Here's the reason you foster. Here's the reason that the gal goes down to big stuff. Is You know what? We understand the power of love. Can I say that again? You understand the power of love, and you know that because you know it from two sides. One, you know it from the side, personal side. When you feel loved by somebody, that feels good. And when you don't feel loved by somebody, that doesn't feel good, and especially if it's somebody that's very close to you. So you know how love can pick you up or, or, or bring you down. And uh, the second part of it is we know when we love people, we know how that can change them. We know that they need love. Sometimes uh, you just kind of just get into that, and you, and you know that as well. How many of you, as a, as a show of hands, have been here whenever we've talked about the five love languages of love, the five languages of love. Raise your hand. Okay, how many have not? Raise your hand. Okay, so we speak about it every year, so I gotta speak about it again, but uh, basically what it is, when you look at love, love is expressed five different ways. In other words, like this. Let's say you're a person that you had words of affirmation, that was your love language, and somebody says to you, uh, I love you. That fills your love tank, All right? But let's say you have words of affirmation, your mom or dad never said they loved you. Your dad worked and spent time with you, but he never said he loved you. That just doesn't feel the same. Well, the basic five love languages are physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, quality time, and receiving gifts. So those are the things that speak love to you. If you get a gift, if any of you guys have ever had an anniversary forget, forgotten, and your love language is gifts, you know how that hurts. For those of you that your love language isn't gifts, it doesn't speak love to you, you say, okay, well, they just forgot it. Here's the point. Can we speak love better, yes or no? Yes. And you can speak it well. 
It's not enough just to say you love somebody when, when what their, uh, their love language is quality time. You gotta spend time with them. I mean, how many of you as moms for the holidays just want your biggest gift? What did I get you for mom for holiday? Just be what? Just come back home, just be here. That says love. So here's the reality. Saying that you love somebody is deficient if it's not followed by quality love or love that speaks volumes. Got that? So you can love somebody and they won't know it. I'm sure a lot of parents have loved their kids, but their kid needed it shown in a different way and it just didn't manifest itself as well as it could have. Okay, so here's where the series is going. Not about love, but did you know faith has the same type of love languages? God says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. I mean, not your behavior, not all your love, but it's without faith in him, it's impossible to please him. So what faith language do we speak to God to have him pleased, to, to worry about his uh, approval? What's faith? And if I looked at you right now, you say, well, I don't know. Are there languages of faith? Yeah, there are. Here's the goal. So for the next four weeks, I want you to show up, turn up. And if you're watching online, turn back in again. If you're watching out in the foyer hallway, come back again. Because you need to know the language to speak to God about faith. And here's why. Some of us have had a faith that it doesn't impact much of anything. Our children don't want our faith. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus. It's just not a faith that makes a huge difference. So there is a way to activate your faith, to empower your faith according to God, according to Scripture, that makes a difference, that charges you. Don't we want that? Don't we want to have a faith that has some power to it? Anyway, so here's just a, a reminder I wrote down. There's a faith standard that's been set for us. There is a faith standard. There are components of faith that when we put them into play, they create power. Let me say that again. There's a faith and components of faith that when we put it into play, it creates a power in our life that God activates. Some of us are missing it. We haven't experienced it. We believe in Jesus. We believe that he lived, died, and rose again, but we haven't experienced his faith. So I'm just going to give you some names just real quick to remind you. And uh, first one I thought of was Abraham. Now, Abraham was a guy that was told he had a, a good family, he had a good life where he was going, and God said, okay, here's the deal, I want you to move. I want you to go to a whole different land. And in fact, I want you to trust the impossible. Something is going to happen that you thought you couldn't happen along. You thought you couldn't have a baby, and I'm going to give you one through your wife. So I want you to trust this. I want you to go with me. So Abraham had this faith, and it took some guts. He moved Followed God, not knowing where he's go, and you know what came out of it? The entire nation of Israel. Today, every, every Israelite can look back to Abraham and can see where his faith mixed with his guts, following God, God used and changed some things. Well, another one I think of is Joshua. When the Israelites were getting ready to go into the promised land, uh, they sent out 12 people into the land to look at it and spy it over to say, is this where we should go? This is the land we believe God's bringing us to. Should we go in there? 10 came back and said, nah. Giants, too big of people, too many of them. They're too strong, too powerful. No way. And then two of them, and one of them, me and Josh, said, we can do this. With God, we can do this. They have weaknesses. If God brought us here, he'd see us through it. See, Joshua had faith in guts. Abraham had faith in guts. Now, the situation in both of them didn't look like, you know, Abraham, where are you going to go? I don't know, but I'm going to follow God. That's pretty scary. Joshua, what do you think? The odds seem against us, but you know what? I feel like God's saying, we can do something here, faith in guts. There's a guy named Esther. She was an Israelite, taken from the Israelites, and she became a queen uh, of the power players in that day. It wasn't Israelites. And Esther uh, saw what could have happened to all the Israelites. She saw that there was a man who was jealous, that was the right-hand man of the king who she was married to, and he said, here's what I want to do. They won't bow down and worship me, so I want him to be killed and possibly all the rest of the Israelites after that. Esther went and spoke to the king. You didn't do that. You didn't have an audience with the king. You never called upon the king. The king called you, you came. It was a brutal time period. So she risked saying, I got to speak to the king about this. She risked going to the king, and all of her friends were saying, don't do this, Esther. If you do this, you're not going to come back alive. It's going to be very bad. And she said this according to scripture. She says, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to go and speak to him. And she did. And you know what? It all ended up good because of that conversation. The right person got lifted up and the wrong person got taken away. She saved a whole group of people because she had faith in what? Guts. Say that with me, faith in guts. Faith in guts. Well, then I think about this guy named Jesus. Would we say he had faith in guts? 
faith to believe why he came, faith to live out faithfully the life that he could, that we couldn't, faith to be humiliated on a cross, faith to give up his life willingly when he could have called down a legion of angels, faith to trust people even when they betrayed him, faith to ask God not to hold that against him as people were hurting him, ridiculing him, and faith to trust that he was strong enough and God in his infinite wisdom knew this to take the entire sins of all mankind on his shoulders. The shame, the regret, the pain, and faith to bury that and rise victorious over it. Jesus had faith and guts. He had faith and guts. So then I go back a little bit further. The 12 apostles, at least 11 of them, they had faith and guts. It's said that 11 of the original 12 will take Judas out of the picture that they got martyred for their faith. They died for their faith. Meaning, you're, if you don't recant Jesus, if you don't not quit acting this way, you're gonna die. And they said, hey, bring it on. And they died for their faith. Do you think the apostles didn't have faith in guts? They had faith in guts. We had a guy named Paul. If you read about Paul, he's one of the, the penmans of half the New Testament that God used him to teach us a lot of things. He writes over and over again about how he's facing uh, beatings, uh, shipwrecked, hardships over and over again. And he kept coming back and back for more. You think he had faith in what? Faith in what? Guts. He had faith in guts, no question about it. The early followers of Jesus, if they stood up for Jesus, most of them were Jews at that time. If they stood up for Jesus, they were kicked out of the synagogue, their family where they uh, did commerce, where they worshiped. They were ostracized by most of the Jewish community. And the government at that time period, the Roman government was persecuting followers of the way, followers of Jesus. So the early Christians, when they stood up and said, hey, I'm, I'm standing up for Jesus, you think they had guts? I mean, they could lose their family. They could lose their job. They could lose their life. They had guts, faith and guts. We stand on the shoulders of many people who were empowered by their faith and guts. Now, here's what I wanted to ask you real quick. Do you believe that guts goes along with faith, yes or no? Do you believe that faith and guts honors God, yes or no? yes. Remember, God says, without faith, you can't please me. I want you to trust me and believe who I am. Faith and guts are huge. So here's the question that I want you to think about. Is faith and guts prevalent at all today in our mind? Or is it just love and grace, grace and truth? And I'm saying those are great things. I'm not demeaning those or, or minimizing those. I'm asking you, when you say to yourself, oh, look, I gotta show more grace, I gotta show more truth, I gotta be more loving, I gotta be more compassionate. Do you ever ask, I need to have more guts? Now that's the terminology that maybe is of my era. I don't know if we use it anymore. I remember you know, all the time, do you have the guts to do this? People dare somebody, do you have the guts to do it? Maybe I haven't heard that. But when I read my Bible, when I think about the heroes of the faith where God commends them, every one of them had guts. Faith and guts was a big, big deal. So just as a thought of you right now, and I don't need you to agree or disagree, or to, to reply, can you name three people in your mind that had faith and guts, like some of these that I mentioned? Can you just think of three people in your mind? Or even, let's even personalize it more. Do you have this kind of faith and guts? I mean, do you have the kind of faith and guts where it looks like if everything's stacked against you and you believe God wants you to do it, you're gonna do it anyway? Do you gotta have the kind of faith and guts that if it cost you your life, or maybe even this is a tough one, Maybe even the comfort of your family that you would step up for God and say, do this. How did Christianity get out of the first century? Because there's a whole group of people that followed Jesus that had a whole lot of faith in what? Guts. And we stand on their shoulders. So here's a question. Risking comfort, risking status quo, risking the easier route. If today we went all back in time and we were Abraham, we were Joshua, we were Esther, we were the early apostles, we were the followers of the way, we were these people. Would we have ever, would we have ever had a people? Would we have ever had a nation? Would we have ever had a place where we gather under God's guidance? Would we ever have a voice in culture? We'd, would we have ever had a hope or a way of life that other people recognized? Or if we would have had no guts, would we have just capitulated to the culture of the day? Would we have just bent over and said, no, 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 
my faith goes so far. But when you take it past this line, there's no guts. There's no guts. It's not there. I'm not going that far. I wouldn't do what Abraham did. No, when I saw the yard stacked against me, I wouldn't tell Joshua. I think God's with us. Esther, I would have just been quiet and been a queen. Jesus, you should have maybe stayed back up in heaven. The apostles, you shouldn't have died. You could have just been quiet at times, lived a little bit longer life. Paul, just chill back a little bit. You didn't have to go reach all the people, the rest of the world that God called you to try and go reach and plant churches. See, I question today, today, how prevalent is the thought of faith in guts? And I'm just going to just say something right off the bat. In the culture that we're moving into in our country, if you have a faith without guts, it's not going to impact what, what's going on. It's a time period right now where faith and guts are critically important to all of us. I'm going to give you the context of something, the scripture I'm going to read from you. The goal of this series is to understand, like I told you, more about hope and what things we can add to hope to really empower it, I mean, to faith, to add to it, to it really can make it strong. Here's the context. Jesus, for three years, had been speaking in this area. And for three years, he had spoken incredible words of wisdom. And the people knew it. They said, you speak with an authority we've not heard of before. We've never heard this. This is a new teaching. He must be of God. Nobody can say this if they didn't know it. People were saying that. And then he did miracles that showed his authority over nature. I mean, he, he uh, calmed storms, like rain and hard, stop, it stopped. Like wind blowing, blowing 60 miles, stop, it stops. He talked over nature and, and, and uh, uh, changed water into wine. So he showed that he could, uh, had power over nature, did miracles walking on water. The people at the time knew this. They'd either seen it or heard it from a credible source that said, this is what he's done. It's unbelievable. Then he healed people of diseases. Not diseases that were, you couldn't diagnose or couldn't see. Cripples that had been crippled for 37 years got up and picked up their mat. Dead people rose that had been in the grave. The King James Version of the Bible says, and he stinketh. He can't come out of the grave. And Jesus says, he'll come out and he won't stinketh. He's okay. He had raised people out of the grave. And they'd be whole again after being in there for days. People knew this. They heard these stories. This group of people that I'm talking about knew this about Jesus. They knew he was wise beyond words. They knew he had done miracles that no man could explain other than he came from God. And they believed that he was the Messiah, the chosen one of God, the Savior of the world that God sent. They knew this. They believed that. They'd seen it. They could come to no other conclusion. they had heard what Jesus said. They'd seen what his followers said, and they could come to no other conclusion. This group of people that we're talking about were the religious Jewish people of the day that we mention here. They were the, some of the religious leaders of the day. So we pick up in John chapter 12, verses 42 through 43. This is kind of the, the, the crux of what we're going to look at a little bit today. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. They're talking about the Jewish leaders. Yet at the same time, they believed in him. They saw what he did. They heard what he did. They uh, knew what he said. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. The Pharisees were a group of religious leaders that why they heard about Jesus, why they knew about Jesus, they didn't want to acknowledge Jesus. So there's some other religious leaders that said, again, yet at the same time, that even among the leaders, they believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. Why? When I read this, why? Why? You knew who he was. You're saying that he's the Savior. You've seen him raise people from the dead. Cure illnesses. You've seen him uh, do things with nature that were unexplainable. You've heard him say he came to fulfill the prophets that you read about of old and the stories of old. Why? Why? What, what's your deal? Why would you publicly say anything? Just because of these Pharisees. And it said, for they loved. Read it. What does it say? Human praise more than what? Let's say that again. They loved what? More than what? They love the approval of people more than the approval of God. They love the approval of their son or daughter more than the approval of God. They love the approval of mom and dad more than the approval of God. They love the approval of their boss more than the approval of God. They love the approval 
of their friends more than the approval of God. They had the right belief. Yet at the same time, many among these, they believed in him. They had the right belief. But they had no guts. Do you think any of those leaders of that day changed anybody? Do you think we'll read any of their names anywhere else further on in Scripture? Not a chance. Because that faith wouldn't have gotten out of the first century. That faith would have went away with any persecution, any hardship. That faith, God doesn't lean into. That faith does not please God. So I want to show you something. We're going to make it a little bit more personal now. Here's a picture of a scale. I kind of got this for you. So this is a scale. And imagine on this side is the esteem of people, and on this side is uh, the commendation of God. When they had to make a choice, do I want to do what God wants me to do, or do I worry about what people say? They dropped weight in here. See, the approval of people carried more weight than the commendation of God. That is a simple picture. But you know what's so crazy about that? And this is where it's personal. That just didn't happen 2,000 years ago. That happens today with you and with me. I became a Christian in my early 20s. And uh, I, I fully believe that what God said about Jesus, what Jesus lived in the Bible, his life, that, that it was right. I fully believed it. And uh, I jumped in, uh, kind of both feet. And I wanted to start reading my Bible, wanted to start learning more about uh, what, who Jesus was and, and, and uh, what he taught. So I was working at this store called the Sports Connection in Fenton Plaza, which is the location is still there. And uh, as I'm sitting there working, I was a manager of the store in my early 20s. My faith had been about a year or two old. A guy comes walking in, and I'm reading the Bible on the counter. I didn't see him walk in. And as he came in, I thought, oh, gosh, he's going to see me reading my Bible. And I sheepishly pushed it off to the side below the counter. I didn't want him seen reading my Bible. I worried more about his what? Well, you know what? Uh, after I did that and he left, I felt bad. In fact, I felt kind of sick at my stomach. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to put the praise of people worrying about me over the commendation of God worrying about me. I'm going to always say, what would God say about me first rather than what would my wife say to me or what my children would say to me or whether what my friends would say to me or some guy I don't even know that walks in off the street or some fraternity brother or some sorority sister or some grandma or some aunt. And, you know, I felt bad. I didn't like that feeling. I didn't like what I did. And you know what? I'm going to say this boldly too as I can. I don't think God liked it either. I think he knew at that time, hey, Tom, that's not the kind of faith that's going to change anything. That's not the kind of faith that your kids are going to want to look up to if you have them. So uh, I said, that's just not going to happen again. I didn't like the feeling. And uh, you might say, Tom, well, that's trivial. You know, somebody came in, you're reading the Bible, you know, you had a job to do, you put it away. That's just trivial. Can I just tell you this, especially if you're just starting your walk with Jesus? There's nothing in your faith walk with Jesus, certainly early on, that's trivial. God's watching every single situation that goes on to see how your faith is growing or moving or not, to see if he can trust you more with more things in your life. I believe that with every ounce. I think scripture teaches that. Faith in guts is a big deal, and you can't have the faith that God would commend if you don't have guts. And at times, here's the other problem. You say, well, I don't know when that ever happens to me. If you ask God to do it, you'll know deep inside, because there'll be times that he'll put you in right now, so okay, now you got a choice. This is the choice, and it may cost you something. So I started thinking, well, what, what are the things, why, do, uh, why would the people of 2,000 years ago worried more about the esteem of people more than the commendation of God. Why would they have done that? Why would they have hidden it in, in regards to G Jesus? There's three things then with my reigning time that I want to tell you about. First thing's popularity. They worried about popularity. 
Well, you know what? If I, if I believe Jesus, then the key leaders of the synagogue, they're not going to like me. So therefore, I'll keep it hidden. I won't even talk about it. Now, how many of you have been in a situation where you worried about what your coworker would think or what your grandma would think or about what your uh, uh, sports team members would think, your band members would think? I'll be less popular. You worried more about your popularity, your popularity, than the commendation of God. Were you any different than the people we read about 2,000 years ago? No. And then I'd even ask you to say this, look deeper. If you've done that, how did it feel? Really, really, what what made a difference with that? Did it hurt or help? And I don't care, by the way, whether you're 15 or whether you're 85 right now. You can worry about popularity and what other people think over the commendation of God, and your faith probably doesn't have much impact to many people around you. You, What you believe is right. It's just that your faith is gutless. It has no guts. No power to change anybody. No power to change anybody at your work. Can I just, and again, I know this is hard because I'm saying it to myself too. If you've never impacted anybody that you're around with your faith, it's probably because you just need some guts to it. So much hangs in the balance. I I mean, I, I almost could cry thinking about it. Guts, faith and guts. I'm so thankful for those brothers and sisters that have gone before us that have shown faith and guts to do things that were costly, but were right. Well, the second thing is we're worried about failure, risk failure. Sometimes we want the, the esteem of people because, well, if we fail, they'll think we're, we're bad. They'll think something's wrong with us. They'll think we're stupid. You know, uh, I had a, a person on Twitter, a gal that I, I uh, totally respect. She was tweeted out on a gym. She said, I have a problem. And she said, uh, I'm at this gym. My membership expires in about a month. And there's this hot guy that I think uh, we'd make a good match. And she said, so I, I want to know what I should say to him and what I should do. And normally I don't respond. This is a student that we've had. And so normally I don't respond. Sometimes I do. And I thought, you know what? And kind of in a joking way, but truthful, here's, here's what I wrote, I, I wrote to her. I said, look, I said, here's what I do. Go up to the guy that's attractive and say, hey, I got a question for you. And he'll say, what? Ask him, would you like to go to church with me? I said, now here's what's going to happen. If he's a Christian, he's going to be impressed because he's probably never had another girl that's a Christian ask him that not for a first date. And I think he's going to think, this is a girl that's got some faith with some what? Guts. First date, go to church. Now, second thing may happen. He may say, no, I'm not interested in church. Good. Then God's got somebody better for you. Walk away. Some of you that are single right now, you run into a guy. I dare you. I'll even say it this way. I'll let God prompt you. Ask the question. See what God does with that. He might find your husband. And you say, no, I won't. Faith and guts. Abraham didn't think he'd create a nation. Joshua didn't think he'd find the land. Esther didn't think she'd save her people. The apostles thought this might stop right away when Jesus was in the grave. They didn't see him raising from the grave. Yeah, I tell you what. God's all into faith in God. He's all into it. Um, I'll give you a 10-year lesson about that, about failure risk, risk of failure. I started a a business back in 1988, and uh, I was roughly 29 years old. uh, And it lasted for 10 years, grew to be a a pretty big company from one coast to another coast, and it failed, and, and it went under. And I always questioned God while this was going on. I said, God, why is this? I mean, I'm not, I'm not pillaging the company for money. I'm not doing this out of greed. I mean, I had a good value system while we were doing it. And, and I think God gave me a 10-year lesson on failure. See, I hadn't failed at much stuff in my life. And I think what God taught me was, was Tom, here's the, the reality. Here's what failure is. See, failure is, is not not succeeding. Failure is not trying. Can I say that again? See, failure is not not succeeding. I mean, if you, don't, if you say, well, I, I failed, I didn't succeed, that's not failure. Failure is that you didn't try. You didn't try. You didn't either trust what God was doing or what you, you, you didn't do. And I learned that lesson. And you know, right after that business closed in 1998, I learned a few things uh, about trusting God. And during that time period from 1998 to 2002, 
I wrestled with failure. I wrestled with faith. And in 2002, I felt I was called by God to start a church, to leave a church I love, to leave a church my children were baptized in, to leave a church I came to faith in. And you know what? That took some faith in what? I remember telling my wife, Kathy, Kathy, I said, I fully understand. I think I'm being called to do this. If you don't want to leave this church, do not. But I got to do this. Now, you know what? I, even if it didn't pan out the way it has, I, never, I won't look back. I won't hide my Bible again. It just, it just isn't right. God doesn't lean into that. How about you? What's God putting on your heart to try? What purse to sell to help some third world country? What child to foster? What is there something that you say, well, I don't do this. How many of you are afraid of making a, a statement about your relationship with somebody? To say, look, I'm going to set some guidelines that, that honor God in our relationship. And, and if you walk, I don't want you to, but if you do, I get it. But I'm going to look for his commendation, not for your approval. See, it's the same thing. And God's looking from heaven saying, trust me, trust me, your faith pleases me. When it has guts to it, it pleases me. Well, risk of failure. That's just, that's a tough one. And you know, some reason too, I just wanted to say this, and this is a short one. You know, sometimes uh, we, we're afraid of failure because we have an ego. I realized when my, the business failed that God took 10 years to get rid of my ego. Tom, it's not about you. It's about trusting me. And if, you, if it doesn't work in your world, you can still trust me if you did it with me and for me. You know what ego stands for? Edging God out. And if your ego gets in the way of you trying something for God that he's prompting deep in your heart to try, you've just edged God out. And it could be a phone call to your sister to say, hey, let's get this thing right. We haven't talked for five years. I mean, this is a big, big deal, people. We have a whole generation. We have a whole family, all friends, that if we have some faith and guts to it, it's going to change so many things, so many things. Well, then the last one is the stuff. See, when we have more stuff, more money, more toys, more gifts, more whatever, more uh, talents, then we worry about how people look at them. And what God says with this stuff is, and I'm not ashamed to tell you, he says, look, the first 10 that I give you, the first 10%, that goes back to me. Take a risk of faith. Have some guts. Return it to me. Return it back to the kingdom to, to, to raise up churches and people that can tell more people about Jesus. And you say, well, I don't, you know, I don't know if I can do that. Okay, I know. It's a gut issue. It's a gut issue. Some of you say, well, I, I've got time, but I don't want to show up two hours early here. Yeah, I know. People might say, well, you go to church and you're like, you're there like all the time every week. Yeah, I know. It won't get a steam of, steam of people. Or some of you, we need you to help with kids. And you say, well, what do I do? I help, I hold a kid on Sunday morning. They go, that, that's it? That's all you do? And it's, you worry about your time and your ego and your stuff other than the commendation who's God saying, you, you hold my treasured child, the one I created. Finally, I told you earlier, there's nothing trivial when you start your faith, your journey of faith, when you apply guts. Went down to Florida and 41 kids made a public statement. 41 kids had the guts to step up and step out on a beach where there are people walking all over that were from different hotels and motels, on a beach when there are literally hundreds and hundreds of other students looking around. 41 of them would fit from about that wall to about this section of seats. It was cool just watching them all in the ocean lined up. They stepped out. They had some guts. Now, you know, before I tell you about some other groups of people, I hope these things don't get in their way. Popularity failure of risk and stuff, where they worry more about the esteem of people from here on in than the commendation of God. But there was a group of people uh, down at camp, we brought over 200 kids that uh, knew, to st knew to step up. They just didn't. And, and here's why. Some of them didn't fully believe who Jesus was yet. They weren't really sure of that. They haven't fully heard that story completely. Some of them have heard it, aren't sure if they believe it. Some of them have some questions. I get that. I get that. Those are the people that shouldn't step up and step out. Those are the people that shouldn't have been anywhere near that beach to be baptized. 
until they've figured that out, that they believe who Jesus is, that they believe who God is, that they believe just like the religious leaders did 2,000 years ago, that he was the Messiah, he was the Savior, their Savior. They shouldn't have gotten baptized. But then there were some, there were some that already believed in Jesus. But they couldn't stand in front of people. Even strangers they didn't know. You know, Jesus would always teach something. And he'd draw a line in the sand. He said, here's what I've taught. Now obey it or don't, but that's what it is. Forgive people as I've forgiven you or don't, but that's the line. Show grace, show truth. Then he said, believe and be baptized in identification of your faith. He drew the line in the sand. When Jesus first publicly got have was acknowledged as the savior of man by God. The next thing he did, he was baptized. Baptized, acknowledged by God, then baptized. He stood. All the early believers, they'd hear about Jesus, they'd believe Jesus, then they'd be baptized. They'd have a public proclamation of their faith. Now, I always wondered why. Why, why did God use baptism? You know why? I think it takes some guts to publicly step up in front of people to tell them about something that God had already done inside of you. They did that. So I started thinking about some of you and some of you that are watching. And I started thinking about this baptism thing. It's a big deal to God, big deal to Jesus. He says, believe and be baptized. It's what our mission statement follows. Matthew 28, it's to make followers of Jesus Christ who in turn make followers of Jesus Christ. To have faith mixed with guts. And some of you won't have faith and guts until you get this right with God through this step called baptism. And I've heard all the excuses. This was even some I get down there. I'm going to just give these where you don't have to bring them to me. I can already tell you. In, two, in August 12th, we're having a baptism service up here. It's going to be a baptistry right here. It starts at 4 o'clock. We're hoping we have to move it up earlier because more people, so many more people want to get baptized. We're going to hear some students' testimonies. Here's some of the excuses. I've heard and I heard down there from some of the kids. I, I, I don't want to get baptized. I look terrible wet. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I got that. Well, I don't want to stand in front of people. I just, you know, I'm, I'm real nervous. I'm shy. I'm terrified to stand in front of people. Here's my point is I get that. Well, Jesus stood in front of people, nailed to a cross naked, bleeding from every spot of his body because he'd been beaten near death, spat upon by those who didn't believe in him, cursed in front of everybody and in front of his father. And you tell me you, you're uncomfortable standing in front of people. Yeah, I know. Faith. But no. Then I've heard this one. Well, I was baptized as a baby. I know that's the tradition you made it came out, out of and that might be what your mom did for you. But that's not what scripture teaches. And you need to stand up and do for the commendation of God, not for the esteem of people. You need to be baptized after belief. And I know some of you are confirmed. A bunch of other junior high boys and junior high girls got confirmed, but you only did it because they were doing it. You only did it because it's the last step to get out of that class. And now a few years later, you believe. You need to have some guts and you need to get baptized in identification of that belief. Some of you say, well, my family would disapprove. They might, but he won't. He won't. Some of you have said, well, you know what, Tom? I've been going to Oak Bridge a long time, and, you know, and, 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 and I'm a faith, faith-filled person. And if I decided to do this now, I'd be admitting, first of all, that I was wrong. But I'd be embarrassed that I hadn't done this a long time ago. Because we've talked about it. I've known about it for like 15 years. And, but I'd be embarrassed if I stood up and stood out. I know it. The esteem, esteem of people. And here's the point. God knows it. Get past that. Get past that. You have the opportunity to cross the line. You have the opportunity to show some faith and guts. You just got to step up and step out. Right belief. Those early believers had right belief. But they loved human praise more than praise from God. They had no faith with any guts. Today, you need it. Can I just say this? 
your family. Listen, mom, look at me. Your gift you can leave to your children is a faith that's tied in with guts where they want to have your faith in the God you trust, not in the God you just believe in and trying to have comfort. They want to see you take some risk for God. They want to see you trust God when it doesn't seem like you should trust God. They want to hear your story about, you know what, I just, I just knew God was asking me to do this and it didn't totally make sense, but I did it. I risked it. Mom, they need that. And, get, and dads, it's more for you. You have such an impact on students and children and family members. You need to step out when God gives that small voice inside and say, go make that phone call, go do that. And listen to me, it's not age resistant. If you're 85 right now, if you're 90 right now, and you know your time is short, you have faith with guts, you walk boldly to the end, and you say, God, use me till my last breath. And you see if he doesn't do that, that's the kind of faith that activates God. And if you're 17, and you're saying right now, well, I'm young, I can't do anything, you're so dead wrong. It's God mixing with your faith at your campus, at your school, to change people who will never hear about Jesus except maybe this one season where you're there. We can do this, people. I wasn't going to say this, uh, but I'm going to give you something to remember. Guts makes our faith powerful, and it's one that God uses. But here's the saying I wasn't going to use, but I want you to think about this. It's faith and guts. Say that with me. It's faith and guts not butts. Yeah, I, I had a mom tell me right after the first service, she says, my little daughter was here and she's three. She says, tell Pastor Tom what you heard. She goes, faith and guts, not butts. <laughs> it's faith and guts, not butts. But God, did, but God, it's faith and guts, not butts. Don't you want a church that's got some guts? Look, we're moving Oak Bridge City. We've got another campus we're open in the fall. Do you think Satan's gonna sit on the sideline and let, us, and let us do this easily? What do you think? No, but here's my point. The gates of hell aren't gonna stop what we're gonna do. I'm not gonna hide the Bible. We're not gonna hide the Bible. We're gonna step up with people and you're gonna show them the love and grace and mercy and truth and beauty and power of God. And it takes all of us. It's going to take you holding babies. It's going to take you leading the parking team. It's going to take you praying for people. When you have faith and guts, God is activated by that. It's like the love language where you love somebody with physical touch and it makes it come alive. When you have faith and guts, God says, I'm all in on this one. As I look around, I'm trying to look at eyeballs and I'm closing this down just a second. As I look around, see, you may be Abraham. You may be Esther. You may be Paul. Maybe not to a whole nation, but maybe to your family. Maybe, listen to this, maybe to your children's children or your children's children's children. God, we thank you. We thank you for this thing called faith with guts. We thank you that our brothers and sisters have gone before us. We thank you that we serve a savior who is full of it. We thank you that it empowers us and that you're waiting to watch us as we apply it. And you're wanting to, to say, okay, there's more for you. This is the great adventure. When we combine faith with guts to do things that seemly, seemingly may be uncomfortable, dangerous, risky, even strange or weird to the outside world, you step into it. God, I pray for our church. I pray for our families. Father, may we be a people that when you look at, we care more about your commendation than the praises of other people. God, we thank you. It's in your son's name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing to our king.
After me, faith and guts, guts. not butts. butts. Can I tell you something? You guys are all part of every life that's changed. If you give here, if you serve here, if you regularly attend here, if you pray for this place, you're all part of it. We try and set the bar as high as we can. Every year we have this thing called the Obturnship, which is, is a beautiful project for kids that are graduating, seniors in college and up. And, and we always have this challenge to want to lower it, to kind of take away some of its guts, to make it easier. We know there's lake visits on the weekend. We know there's vacations. We know there's other things you can do. But now I'm speaking to you guys. You tell me, was it worth it? They have some guts to say, we'll say no to some of these pleasures of life that other people are doing. We'll spend more time with God. We'll read this book that we're supposed to read. We'll study the Bible. We'll read through these passages. Does God step into that picture and do a miracle that you're part of that we can't deny but we can't explain? You're part of that too. That's what he wants for you. Your name might be Mary. It might be Joe. Maybe it's not Abraham. Maybe it's not Paul. But God is the same God who leans into faith and guts no matter where you're at. Hey, I hope you come next week. There's three more components of faith that when you get these right, just like you love languages brings love to life, faith comes out. Amen? See you guys next week. Thanks for coming. Go sign up for baptism too. Baptism sign-ups right out front.